whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, sir. Welcome, everyone, to episode 96, Four Away from 100. So close. Mm -hmm, So close. Uh, Thank you for all the recent ratings and reviews. Thanks for telling your friends. Uh, We've been getting, uh, you know, more new listeners recently, growing more than normal, very motivating, and very much appreciated. A uh, quick merch announcement now, and then there will be an announcement for the next Scared to Death fan horror story book, volume two, coming up in a second. Eee. Excited for that. Uh, but first, very cool horror addict ringer tea and regular crew neck tea in the store now at badmagicmerch.com. The font used, uh, it gives me like a cool 70s horror movie kind of film poster, you know, horror mm-hmm. film poster vibe. I know what you mean. Yeah, like a grindhouse kind of, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then charity time. Uh, This month in July, while we don't have the exact amount at this moment, we will be uh, donating over $14,000 excited to do that, uh, to donate to supportsurfside.org, a hardship fund just established by the Miami Heat basketball team to help those impacted by the devastating building collapse in Surfside, Florida. This past June 24th, at approximately 1.30 a.m., a 12-story residential building with 136 units partially collapsed. I'm sure most of you have heard about this. The search for residents continues. Thank you to the Annabelles and Roberts who support us on Patreon. 20% of your contributions this month, along with the contributions of the Space Lizards from Time Suck, going a long ways to help those devastated by this tragedy recover as best they can. So crazy. Yeah, so crazy. Do you know that they said that sometimes they find people in rubble seven days after? Yeah, still alive, correct? Seven days. Yeah. That's, I, that's. I remember reading stories like that from previous, from 9/11 you know. 9-11 and such? Not even, yeah, it wasn't necessarily that one, but yeah, some other ones where there was collapse from like, oh my God, like in other countries. Mm-hmm. And then like in the rubble, you know, they would still find somebody, yeah, days out, like you said. Yeah, sometimes there's just like pockets of mm-hmm, air, mm-hmm. and but there's also a fire in that building. Underneath uh, the rubble, it, and it, the weather conditions are really, it's really hot, and yeah. it's raining. It's its a, a very shitty, shitty situation. Um, segwaying into not shittiness, uh, Lindsay has some exciting book details. Yeah, let's talk about something, something happy. Yeah, something happy and fun. Okay, yeah, let's lighten the mood. Okay, so today I'm doing the big merch, merch announcement. Yep. Um, because that means it's time to talk about Scared to Death. The book volume two yay yeah hey. you've been working on this for a while yeah yeah it's amazing um after we did it last year we thought like okay like now we know what we're doing next year it'll be significantly easier and there were parts of it mm-hmm. that were smoother not easier <laughs> <laughs> um okay so i know you all want the juicy details and and i'll give them to you but before i dive into that i just wanted to share a little bit about this year's book i mean like last year mm-hmm. This book will only contain my portion of the show, you know, the fan-submitted stories. But unlike last year, this year will include bonus episodes, which we didn't have last year when the book came out. Um, And so it will include 1 through 11, just so you know, uh, because bonus episode 12 will have not been out yet at the time of the book release. So Mm -hmm. just so you know about that. And then last year, the book was... Nice, lovely, 360 pages, uh, a little bit more than that. And this year's book, this is so crazy to me, it will be over 590 pages of spoopy tales. So basically 600 pages. It is a massive book, and it's just, oh, it's beautiful. Okay, so the details and what you need to know. Uh, The book will be available in a variety of options. You can buy the book autographed by us. You can buy the book Plain Jane, no autograph. You'll be able to buy the book in a bundle with volume one, and you'll be able to buy volume one alone. So let me explain those details and listen closely. Okay, the pre-sale for all of the options will begin next week, Tuesday, July 13th, and they will go live on our merch website, The Stroke Before Midnight, alongside the episode. There are only one thousand autographed copies available we learned a very valuable lesson last year uh that 
signing a lot of books is a lot of work. And I mean, we're happy yeah. to do it, but it was a lot harder than we thought. So the first thousand people to buy a book get their books signed by yours truly and that guy too, I suppose. <laughs> uh, the books are supposed to be in my sweet little hands in September, uh, like mid-September. So if you pre-order the book right now, you will definitely have it before Halloween. And that will give us plenty of time you know, to get the books out and do all the things we need to do. Again, we learned a lot last year. Um, if you order a bundle, you will get it all at once just because that's the best way to handle it. And to clarify on that, if you order a bundle, oh, <laughs> I'm reading the same sentence twice. <laughs> uh, if you're one of the lucky ones and you get a signed copy of volume two, please note that volume one will not be signed. That was last year's thing and we're, we're not going back on that. Okay, so there are a limited number of books in its entirety. So mm -hmm. if you get a signed copy or not, it is limited. And we do suggest pre-ordering because once the books are gone, they're gone. Sort of. We held on to a limited number of Volume 1 books last year, just in case there were books lost in shipping, yeah. damaged in shipping, or like, I don't know, my mom asked me for a book. So we wanted to make sure we had some on hand. So we have some, but there's a very limited number of Volume 1. So yeah. when you go to purchase your book, here are what your options will be. You can buy Volume 1 alone, not autographed. You can buy Volume 2 alone, not autographed. You can buy volume two alone autographed if you're part of the first 1,000 people to order, or you can buy a bundle of volume one and volume two, which could include an autographed volume two if you are part of the first 1,000. If mm -hmm. you are not, you can still order the bundle uh, without it being autographed. Yeah. In all likelihood, if you're part of the first 1,000 and you order a bundle, that you're gonna, we're gonna go through the very small amount of volume two. Yeah. So it, it's gonna go fast. So in, in all likelihood, if you order a bundle, you're getting an autographed book. And so that's it. So just okay. to wrap it up, the books are on sale, pre sale next week, Tuesday, July 13th. You'll have them in hand before Halloween. They will be available in the store at the same time the episode drops, the stroke before midnight Pacific time. There will be multiple buying options, so do whatever's best for you. And remember that the first 1,000 books will be autographed, and once the books are gone, they're gone. So be sure to get your book and get it fast. And I hate to throw you an audible here, but the editor you worked with. Uh, oh, the, Drew, yeah. Drew, okay, okay. Just want to make sure oh, we, uh, yeah. we thanked Drew, because he, I know you've been leaning on him uh, a ton in this process. And he's been, you, you've been telling me yeah. privately that he's been really great. And taken on, like you've taken on more work, yeah. he's taken on more work. Yeah, it's really interesting. Last year, Drew reached out to us, just a fan of the show, mm -hmm. and but is an editor in real life. This is what he yeah. does. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I want to say he's also a professor. God, it's like people tell you what they do, and then yeah. you just focus in on the thing that relates to your life. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but really smart guy, really great. And he just had reached out last year and volunteered yeah. to do it. Yeah. And this year, I mean, we're talking about 200 more pages of, it's not... You just don't read the stories. Yeah. It's like he's got to condense them and make them fit into the correct format. And Logan mm -hmm. had to draw more uh, chapter photos for uh, uh, and at the beginning of each chapter. There's a little hand drawn sketch yeah. and with the bigger book. It's just been more work smoother not so many unknowns like last year yeah. but definitely a lot and of i work. haven't talked to drew so i feel bad i, I don't atana drew atana atana that's right because i never communicate with drew but drew if you're listening thank you so much <laughs> i know you're a fan of uh of uh, what we do here and it's so appreciated and to, to, to see how hard you've worked with Lindsay, it's not gone un unnoticed by me so thank you drew mostly dan's like Thank you for keeping my wife happy. <laughs> and now stories. Story time. Uh, I'm excited uh, to see this project completed. Though. I'm so excited because you know what's so cool? Mm. Like if you have volume one and you have volume two and they're just on they're a pretty. bookshelf and you put them side by side, the cover is, I mean, Logan, again, just like yeah. knocking it out of the park. It's um, little illustrations throughout the book. They're cool. Yeah. They're very it, cool. It's just a very, very, very cool project. Um, how many stories do you have today? Do you have two? I have three. You have three today? I have three. Yeah, okay. because I have uh, like one juicy bigger one yeah and then two less meaty ones any details or surprising mm, us okay i will tell you haunted nursing home oh which all is right. a new thing to be afraid of that mm -hmm. i never thought of but it's like duh of course mm -hmm. and then both story two and story three are um under the premise of like like if your eyes are playing tricks on you or not got it okay but probably not 
I I have two, and I'm really pumped about both. Okay. Uh, both are bigger stories. Mm, mm-hmm. Both, I think, are really creepy. The first one takes us to Georgia, to the supposedly haunted Civil War battlefield battlefield of uh, Chickamauga. A reenactor claims to have had a terrifying encounter with a ghost known as Old Green Eyes. Okay. And then the second story is one of the most unnerving I feel like I've told here in a while. Uh, back to mirrors we go. Oh, buddy. And I've been anxious around mirrors all week because okay. of the story. Two teen girls hold a seance in front of a, a mirror and get a lot more than they bargained for. If you listen to this one in the dark near a mirror and you have an imagination like mine, you may end up covering that mirror or just moving the hell away from it. <laughs> okay. So, Fair enough. Decent amount of historical setup for this first story. Plenty of time to get cozy okay. and, uh, and a blanket for the chills. I have tiny little blue socks on. That's all I'm going to show you because <laughs> I also have on a tiny little skirt because it is 108 degrees outside. Not kidding. <laughs> uh, the Battle of Chickamauga took place in Georgia from September 19th to September 20th. 1863, a key battle during the American Civil War. Over 4,000 died and thousands more went missing and likely died in the bloodiest battle of the Civil War outside of Gettysburg. The battle site is a huge field surrounded by trees with a lake nearby that earned itself the nickname of Bloody Pond, named for the many soldiers whose blood spilled into its water, so many it was stained red for days. Ugh. It was a Confederate victory. Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee defeated the Union soldiers commanded by General William Rosecrans. By mid-September, Rosecrans had pushed a large number of Confederates out of Tennessee into Georgia and gathered his soldiers at Chickamauga. The Confederates were weary and on the run, and then Bragg made the unex- unexpected decision to go on the offensive. He knew what the Union soldiers did not, that reinforcements were arriving. And when they showed up, he'd have 65,000 soldiers at his disposal to take on Rosencrantz, 60,000 men. So 125,000 Americans ready to fight to the death. Wow. In the early morning hours of September 19th, two massive armies met in the woods by Chickamauga Creek. The Confederates pushed the Union back, but at the cost of many lives. After the two-day battle was over, the Confederates suffered 20,000 casualties, the Union another 16,000. The Battle of Chickamauga, the deadliest battle in the Western theater of the war. It was bloody and dark two days. Even the name Chickamauga is dark. In the Cherokee language, it means river of death. To this day, death and despair seem to permeate the air at this old battlefield site, disturbing many of those who drive through or dare to explore the grounds. Edward Tinney, former historian and chief ranger at Chickamauga uh, Chattanooga National Military Park, from 1969 to 1986, said many have claimed to witness the ghosts of dead soldiers on the battlefield. One spirit has been spotted so many times uh, by so many witnesses, he's been given the name Old Green Eyes. Green Eyes, an unknown soldier who allegedly lost his head after being struck by a cannonball, began to be spotted the first night after he died within hours of the Battle of Chickamauga, the hours of of it ending. The former Confederate soldier doesn't seem to know he's dead or that the war is over. He searches the battlefield at night, looking for revenge. Green Eyes appears in many different forms, generally as either the full apparition of a man or as a man's impossibly black shadow. Sometimes he appears as a shadowy beast. No matter what form he takes, he's always recognized by the same glowing green eyes. And he always brings with him a powerful sense of menace, a sense he's still fighting that war and sees you as one of his enemies. Time now for the tale of Old Green Eyes. John had just been hired as a battle reenactor for Living History Days, an American organization that performs various U.S. historical reenactments, including numerous Civil War battle reenactments across the South. John had been hired a month before Battle of Chickamauga, uh, that reenactment. He'd spent the month rehearsing with all the other actors and studying every aspect of the battle. A huge history buff, like nearly all reenactment actors, his friends told him his prep was overkill. He just wanted so badly to do a good job his first time out. He didn't want to be the rookie that screwed up on the big day and let his fellow history nuts down. John was so happy to have his new job. The pay wasn't great. No one gets rich doing reenactments. And he knew he wouldn't do it for long, but it was such a cool bucket list item to check off. History had always been his passion, the American Civil War especially. His biggest wish since he was a little kid was to be able to go back in time, to see and experience what life was like back then, to meet someone from the past, and now he was getting to do that in some small way. He was so excited to try and give the audience a good show to watch. John was lucky enough to get to play a Union soldier. He and the other actors weren't allowed to pick what side they ended up on, and although the Union did lose Chickamauga, he knew a bit more about the history of the Union Army, and some of his ancestors had fought for them. 
As he and the other actors arrived at the battlefield on the afternoon of September 18th, John felt his nerves getting to him. In a good way. He was pumped. The buses dropped him off after driving down the two-lane road that cut through the battlefield, leaving about 200 men behind. The drivers and managers were all going to stay in a nearby warm and comfortable hotel, and they didn't want the men to camp out, but they wanted the men to camp out on the, on the battlefield. We want you to have the full experience. See, hear, feel what all those soldiers did back then. Get in their mindset, his manager told the group on the drive over. See, hear, and experience they did. All they had in terms of camping gear was their army uniform, a bedroll, water canteen, knives, and a replica 1800s rifle. The bags they brought with them had their salted pork and hardtack, their only meals for the next 24 hours. Ugh. It wasn't going to be relaxing, it was going to feel real. Georgia was still hot in September. It hovered around 90 degrees and it was humid. The afternoon heat blazed down on John and his co-workers as they went through a final rehearsal and planning session for the next day. He was sweating in his wool uni uniform and he kind of liked it. Made it feel more authentic. Honestly, he felt pretty badass in a full Union outfit armed with knives and a rifle. Soon afternoon faded into evening and John choked down his miserable rations. It was interesting to eat what those real soldiers ate, but he was glad this wasn't his life all the time. Hardtack tastes awful. Like the world's worst stale giant cracker. Shattering a window with one felt like it would be easier than chewing it up and swallowing it. <laughs> John and his group sat in their makeshift camp, scrolling through social media. It was hard to stay in character the whole time. Phones and flashlights were two modern luxuries they were allowed tonight. The oddity of the situation wasn't lost on him. A bunch of men camping in a field, full historic costumes, scrolling through Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> As the next two hours passed, residents of the small town of Fort Oglethorpe that bordered the battlefield drove down the two-lane road cutting through the battlefield, some stopping to ask them questions. John was happy they were showing interest. He'd, he'd heard from some other guys that attendance had been down, numbers had been dwindling, which was sad to hear. With daylight fading, John finished up his final round of studying, neck craning down over his notes, flashlight soon in hand. Before he knew it, when he checked his phone, it was 10.30 p.m. They had to be up at 5 a.m. the next morning to prepare for the reenactment. He knew he wasn't going to get a good night's sleep, nerves, the hard ground, and the snores of the six men around him would keep him up for a couple of hours before he would actually drift off. And then Grayson, a new acquaintance, asked him, Hey, John, we're going to walk over to Aaron's camp to play some cards. You want to come? John knew what playing cards meant. It meant drinking some moonshine, some other reenactors snuck into camp with their water canteens and maybe playing a little bit of cards. He'd heard other guys talking about it. John wanted to go, but he was only 19, one of the youngest reenactors. None of them were allowed to drink while they were on the clock, but most would only get scolded if they got caught. Since he was underage, though, if he somehow caught, got caught drinking, he'd be fired. He wasn't going to risk that, especially not on his first night. No thanks, he told Grayson. I'm going to try and get some sleep. Grayson shrugged, leaving John behind. He and the other five men from his campsite walked down the hill to their friend's camp. John laid down on the ground, trying to get settled now. Why did they decide to camp so far from everyone else? He didn't recall it being so far during the day, but in the darkness, the lanterns at Aaron's camp seemed like the tiniest orange speck down the hill, probably a football field away, and it was the only camp he could see around him. He thought about how many more men had camped here during the real battle. They certainly didn't have 125,000 men like they did back in 1863. More like around 200. He sighed, closed his eyes, and of course, couldn't sleep. The hooting of owls and the rustling of small animals in the woods all around him kept him awake and on edge. Weirdly, on edge, actually. Why was he so nervous? He camped plenty of times in his life, and he'd never felt kind of scared before. It wasn't like they were in the middle of nowhere, either. Town was no more than a mile away. Still, as soon as his group left, John felt nervous, jumping into the slightest sound. Eventually, finally, John started to drift off. He felt his eyes close against his will, tiredness overtaking him, and then he slipped into sleep, dreaming about the upcoming battle. The sensation of falling jerked him awake. John sat up, panting, eyes scanning to assess his surroundings. He sighed, flopping back down on his bedroll. He could tell that after a, the brief nap, he was not going to be able to fall back asleep again, and tomorrow was going to be a long, hot day. Might as well do something productive, he thought to himself. He blindly reached into his bag, pulling out his battle notes and his flashlight, and rolled over onto his stomach to read. He held the flashlight up, finger poised to click the button, when a light off in the distance caught his eye. Small green light. Two, actually. Like twin fireflies flying close together in perfect unison. That's weird, he thought. I've never seen that before. The fireflies got closer to him as the seconds passed, and bigger, too. 
Feeling the need to check things out a little more, John clicked on his flashlight, shining it out in the darkness in front of him. As he looked again, he wondered if he was dreaming. Those green lights were no fireflies. The lights were coming from someone's eyes. Some type of night vision goggles, maybe? He didn't think that made much sense. Weren't they supposed to be used for sneaking around? But he never actually seen a pair in real life. Didn't know what kind of light, if any, they might give off. Goggles or not, what John could tell for sure was that he was looking at the outline of a large male body and the guy was headed towards him. The guy looked massive, at least six feet tall, burly, bigger than, than lanky John. John couldn't see his features, but he could see those bright green eyes. John couldn't accurately describe how he felt in that moment. Sure, he felt nervous, but also interested in an odd way. He assumed the guy must be another reenactor. Just one, not, you know, not one coming from his camp. He was coming from the wrong direction. He hoped the man kept coming, actually. If he wasn't going to fall back asleep, at least he could talk uh, about history with someone. The man seeming to understand John's secret wishes did keep coming closer. Soon John could see what he really looked like. He wasn't wearing goggles. He had a big beard and long, scraggly, dark hair and bright green eyes. Weird how they seemed to glow. He was wearing a shabby black duster covering a gray battle uniform, a Confederate reenactor. John sat up on his bedroll, gave the man a wave, beckoning him, beckoning him over. The guy saw John's wave, and a huge grin now split his face. And all of a sudden, John no longer wanted to have anything to do with this guy. It wasn't a friendly smile. It was a mad, wicked grin, flashed by a mouth with too many teeth. It made John think of a shark eyeing up its next meal. A lead ball formed in John's stomach. What was up with this guy? Why was he so creepy? The strange Confederate soldier continued to approach him at a steady, unnerving pace, that grin never leaving his face, his green eyes so bright, they truly seemed to be glowing. Soon he was only around a hundred feet away. Now John really started to feel afraid. Some survival instincts kicked in and he knew he needed to leave his camp. If he didn't, something really bad was going to happen. John jumped up, head whipping back and forth, looking for a place to run. And it was like the man could sense his fear. His grin got wider, green eyes shining with an evil amusement. If he ran, would the man run after him, chase him? I guess he'd just have to find out. John started to back up, slowly shuffling out and away from his campsite. To his horror, the man continued to walk towards him, and he was closing the gap. John now started running, taking long, full strides away from the campsite. He wanted to run around this guy and make it to the road that led into Fort Oglethorpe. He hoped that as he ran, he'd run across another group and find someone to help him out. He didn't quite want to scream yet or call for help. What if this was just another actor playing some sort of initiation prank? He'd be the talk of the battle if he did that, and in the worst possible way, he'd be a laughingstock. John continued running, also never taking his eyes off the grinning, now also running man. Who the hell was this guy? Why was he chasing him? Was he some nut? Taking his role as Confederate soldier way too seriously? Some sort of twisted method actor? He knew that wasn't it. He wasn't actually thinking about a ghost yet, but part of him already knew this guy wasn't a regular person. A voice in John's head was now screaming, Get away! This guy wants to kill you! He ran faster than ever towards the road now. The man, dressed like a Confederate soldier, ran behind him, still grinning, eyes still shining. He was now sprinting as fast as he could. He continued to hear the man running behind him, gaining on him. He finally saw it, the gray outline of the pavement and behind it the lights of town. He shuddered with relief while continuing to sprint. Finally, John was crossing the road. He was now in the edge of town. After a few pounding heartbeats passed, he dared to stop and look back over his shoulder. The soldier was no longer chasing him. He was standing on the other side of the road, at the edge of the pavement, those creepy eyes glowing, staring straight at him. John couldn't help but wonder, why didn't he follow me? Despite his better judgment, John now walked back towards the man, Ugh. all the way to the edge of the road on his side call him crazy, but he somehow knew it'd be, he'd be safe. The man's face was serious and angry. When he spotted John, the evil grin returned, but still, he made no effort to cross. John realized the road was some kind of threshold he couldn't cross over, but why? Testing this, John walked left, then right. The man mirrored him exactly, grinning the entire time. John waved, arcing his hand high overhead, and the man eerily matched his movements. John didn't like this mirroring one bit. He continued the strange dance, testing a few more movements, until the rumble of an engine could be heard from down the road. Headlights now illuminated John and the soldier. A woman was driving through. No one else seemed to be in the car with her. Feeling sick, John wondered if this maniac would try to attack her, maybe try and force his way into the car and hurt her. He looked back over to see what the soldier was doing. Nothing. The soldier was gone. The woman drove through without incident, giving John a nervous glance as she passed by. He frantically scanned all around for any sign of those green eyes, but saw only darkness. Now what? All his gear was back at camp. After sitting by the road and stewing over what to do for a good half hour, maybe longer, 
and not seeing those eyes again. John gathered up all his courage, walked down the road about a hundred yards, then ran across back towards Aaron's camp, not stopping until he saw his group playing cards and laughing. John stayed with them until they finally crashed for the night, scanning the darkness around him every few moments for those glowing green eyes. He was so glad he was sitting with his campmates he couldn't handle being alone in those woods again. He couldn't risk being caught alone again by the soldier with the green eyes. Unfortunately, John never saw those eyes again. Oh, that's it? Mm -hmm. oh, I thought it was going to be like, he told everyone at camp and they confirmed the story or like that. Uh, oh, yeah. Like there's that legend. There's that story or uh, they were going to see him, too. Or I'm going to start doing that with your stories. When you finish it, I'm like, what? More? Oh, so well, there's more? I, it doesn't <laughs> feel tied up. Listen, I've been getting a lot of emails about your loose ends. I, okay. Awkward. <laughs> I'm be not being serious. Oh, okay. I <laughs> this is the critique Dan storytelling oh, uh, episode. No. Oh. oh, I just I thought they were. I thought something yeah. else was going to happen. That's good. Oh, okay. How is that a bad thing? That I was like, oh, and then oh, oh, oh. okay, that's it. That's not bad. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, this is this is an artist uh, um, artist's imagining of what old green eyes might look like. Can you? Okay, I like made a note that every time we go camping, I'm yeah. scared. I'm always scared when we go to sleep. Always. I'm scared oh, of like the... before the show or yeah, yeah, just yeah. always, 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 always. Well, I didn't grow up camping and I I remember when we first started taking the kids camping. I mean, you had gone camping with the kids before I was in the picture, but yeah. the first time I didn't sleep the first night, I was like, What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And I still feel that way. Yeah, foreign noises, like um, you know, if you did it, I'm sure it's a thing where if you okay, like go back to like the pioneer days, if you basically were always camping right. compared to now. Then eventually you would just get used to the noises, just like you get used to the noises of a house for the most part. Right. But uh, but when they're completely, they're just so different, and all mm -hmm. the little insects and in the dark, you're like, what is it? Is that a bird? Is that a critter? Is that an insect? Like, what is making that noise? Right. Because there are so many, and there's like you know plenty of nocturnal animals and mm -hmm. things that are active as soon as soon as it becomes dark. Yep. Yeah. And as soon as you hear mm -hmm. the like, what could be like, uh, what gets me is, oh, that could be a snake. Like, right. I, I just imagine that it's going to slither right into my tent, even though there's no holes. I yeah. don't even know if a snake would chew its way through a tent. That doesn't make sense to it me. It would not. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe some like crazy hopped up. <laughs> <laughs> Sna snakes in particular don't have like chewing teeth. Right. Right. Yeah. They're just, they swallow you whole. But <laughs> that would be a terrifying thing to see like a snake with like a predator set of teeth as opposed to a couple little like puncture fangs. I know. For venom. If it just had little teeth and it was just kind of... But it, it kind could, of like nine. It could eat through a tent with its puncture fangs. I don't think it could. Why not? It could puncture the tent. Like a really smart snake that just like just, it would exactly like, it would strike, and then it would move slightly to the side and then strike again. Right, it makes like a little just, hole. Yep, like a little a per, like a perforated thing on on a perforated piece of paper. Uh huh. Uh -huh exactly. Mm -hmm, a really diligent snake. Yes. So yeah. it could happen. Okay, but, but I think yeah. she is hitting on the point that tents the fabric. It's so thin it's between so you and a thin. bear. Right. Like, yes. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you're not in a cabin. You just get, right. You just, Joe it gets could, me. It could take your whole face off. Just in one. Boom. There is that thing with like tent fabric is not. It does. It, it definitely doesn't feel sturdy. No. And I will say any kind of like clawed animal, absolutely. I mean, they could shred through that tent. Yep. Easily. So camping. And I think bears actually do. Bears. I mean, if you, I'm sure. Which is why, like in a lot of uh, uh, park grounds, you're not supposed to leave uh, any. You food. know, food mm -hmm. out and about, like in your tent or not, because they will just wreck things to get to it. Right, right, right. It's not even yeah. that they're necessarily hunting you. Yeah. They just want food. I mean, you might be their food. But, right. But camping is inherently scary to me. And then mm -hmm. when you put that picture up there, I'm like, oh my God, if you heard something, because of course I always have to look. Yeah. And you like peek out and you saw t -t 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 these oh, two little yeah. eyes like making progress mm -hmm. towards you. It'd be so unnerving unnerving i would be losing i would probably pee my pants any kind of i don't know where that comes from like i mean obviously it could come from sightings but that whole thing of like glowing eyes I, I, I don't know why it's so scary i mean i guess you do get that with like certain animals where if you flash a light mm. like i think about that with deer it even like a deer who i, I don't see I don't, I don't find deer to be a creepy looking animal at all sure they, but, in fact they're kind of cute yeah they're pretty cute but at night 
when your headlights uh, mm-hmm. hit them and you just see two glowing eyes, especially if like it hits them kind of out in the distance, so you can't get a firm look at their shape. You right. just you're see not the entirely eyes. sure what is out there. Mm-hmm. That's pretty creepy. Oh, it, when we let the dogs out at night. Oh yeah, their little glowing eyes can look weird. Yes, and I mean we're in a neighborhood. Sure. We're in. I mean I would not a city, but we're. I mean we're in a very yeah. populated area. We have. Mm-hmm. It's not even like there's miles between us and our neighbors, right? Right. We have neighbors. The whole thing. They go outside, and I oftentimes leave the back porch light off because we get these little gnats, and I don't want yeah. them in the house after an incident where the whole house was filled up with them. <laughs> so I I will look, and I will see them, Yeah, but I can only see their eyes, and I, I know it is them. I have watched them go out there. I have watched them stop where they are to do their business, but in my mind, I'm like, or is it? Or, or our dogs are little demons. No, or now there's something else out there. Oh. And then when the dog starts to run towards me, I'm like, oh, God, is that our dog running towards us? Or is that a <laughs> small human? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really, oof. Yeah. So that, oh, that photo mm-hmm. conjures up a lot of things in my brain. Uh, this next one is just a, a, an old painting of the Battle of Chickamauga since we talked about it. Oh, wow. Just so crazy how they would fight back then. It was, you know, way more hand-to-hand. Than it is now, and just the numbers were gigantic. I know. I was thinking that as you were talking about that, just the idea of 125,000. 125,000 people, like just in Georgia, mm-hmm, out having in field. it out. Yep. Yep. It's uh, that's my, cra- it's crazy. My brain can't understand. I can't really a understand small that. City, a small city's worth of people all out in the field with bayonets and muskets. and It's pretty much well, almost I guess all didn't of Well, I did muskets, uh, it wasn't there, but they had rifles, but they were more rudimentary rifles. Yeah. Um, it's basically like if our town went to war. <laughs> right, the whole metropolitan area around yeah, here just I mean, all went to war. I mean, there's not that many more people than that. And all met in the park. If they mm-hmm. all met in they're, McEwen they're Park. They're all down at McEwen, yeah. and they're going to fucking have it out. Some <laughs> people are getting chalked into the lake. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, this next one uh, was is a picture of some reenactors. So that's like you know, kind of how it looked today. That's a that Chickamauga cool. reenactment. Have you ever gone to a reenactment? I never have. No, I never have. I mean, I've I've seen little like YouTube snippets of it. That's I mean, they cool. take it they take it real seriously. Well, I would have a hard time not laughing because of how serious they take it. <laughs> sure. That is my personality. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. bring it down a notch, John. Yeah, they, John. Nerd, they nerd out hard. I mean, it's for hardcore historians. I know, but it is or really historical cool. historical enthusiasts, I guess. Yeah. I could probably like keep my laughter to a minimum <laughs> it, because it is very cool. It is cool. It that, is cool. That looked amazing. And then looking for pics of uh, Civil War reenactors, th- I just found this meme and it just cracked me up. I saw it years ago and it just says, the awkward moment you show up at the wrong Rebel War reenactment and it's a bunch of Civil War Confederate reenactors <laughs> And then there's a stormtrooper like in there, <laughs> and that's just playing off the uh, the alliance to restore the republic versus galactic empire, aka that the is rebels. Funny. Kyler would love that. Kyler would love that. He that's would love very that. that's a that's a nerdy meme for people who understand both the U.S. Civil War and the Star Wars uh, world. That, that's pretty. I, I got it. I didn't need it explained. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, all right. You ready? Okay. You ready to move on to uh, to another story? I f- I found that first story scary. I find the second story really scary. Okay, I, I thought that was really creepy. I thought it was creepy. Yeah. Really creepy. The the mimicking across the road mm-hmm. was the the final straw for me. Where I'm like, what? what the fuck? And then you're gonna run back into those woods? Get the fuck out of here! Just run to town. I would be yeah, done. Just... I would be done. I also wouldn't stay back at camp by myself. Yeah. Under age or not, I would have at least gone with them to hang mm, out. Like when it first, when he first got yes! like, yes, yeah. I was very mad at John. I was like, yeah, you're a fucking <laughs> idiot, Darren, staying by yourself. Well, nothing had happened yet in his defense. Staying alone in the woods where you're not familiar with what's around you mm-hmm. is just inherently not a great choice. Because if all of a sudden you get sick, if you got up to use the bathroom and you encountered anything, if, yeah. like it's just not good. Being alone in the woods, not a great idea. Okay, we've talked about mirrors and the paranormal here before on Scared to Death. Mm-hmm, we have. We talked about how unnerving it is to look into a mirror at night, start to wonder if it's really you staring back at you. Ugh, I won't go in the bathroom Ugh. without the light on anymore. Oh, yeah, if there could be something behind Day you. Day or night. That's it. I, I'm just, I'm not even really afraid of mirrors. It's just that, like, it's lingering in mm-hmm. my subconscious that I should be afraid of the mirror. Right. So I'm just... I think of that terrifying possibility if you looked in the room and the room looked one way and then you looked in the mirror and it felt different. Like just like the reflection wasn't quite accurate. Mm -mm. Yee. Uh, It said that spirits can use mirrors or travel uh, for travel or to communicate with this world as kind of a shiny glass doorway between the worlds of the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. This is something an anonymous forum poster initially found exciting when a friend and her decided they wanted to try performing a seance together to see if they could communicate with something or someone from the other side. 
She thought that, well, maybe they'd see or hear something. She's a, she is a paranormal believer. Uh, they would also be safe. That what they were doing was really not that big of a deal. But then things got crazy. I'll be telling the story from the original poster's point of view. Time now for the tale of the monster in the mirror. My friend Ivy was spending the night. Her parents were out of town, and they didn't want her to be in the house alone. Or maybe they didn't trust her to not throw a party while they were gone, which she should for sure would have done. I was happy to have one of my best friends staying with me for a week. We made all sorts of plans, from watching scary movies to makeovers, and best of all, a seance. We checked out a few different websites that gave instructions on how to do one. We thought it sounded creepy and cool because it was going to be the highlight of the stay. We thought we'd wait until the last night to do it. But then the more we thought about it, the more excited we got, and we decided, why wait? And we tried it the second night of our week together. Oh, boy. It was nearly midnight by the time we finished setting everything up. We found a script online for how to contact spirits and printed off two copies so we could say the words together at the same time. We created a circle of candles for protection. It looks so cool in the dark. We set up in front of my closet, which has mirror doors. We'd read somewhere that spirits could use mirrors to travel and communicate, and we figured the mirrors might boost our chances of seeing something. Once the candles were lit, we turned off the lights, sat down in front of the mirrors, and started to recite the chant we'd selected. Fuck. After we read it for the first time, we sat there silently listening for any sound that could indicate that something might now be in the room with us. My entire body was tingling with fear and anticipation. It was so creepy. I knew it would be crazy, but with the candles playing with the light and then the mirror reflecting everything and distorting the shadows, it was a bit scarier than I'd expected. Quite a bit. After reading that summoning ritual, what we were doing didn't seem like such a good idea anymore, and I went from thinking it would be cool to see something to really hoping we did not see anything. Ivy didn't seem nearly as scared as me. After she looked around the room following our first reading not seeing anything paranormal, she said, let's try again, see what happens. As much as I actually didn't want to now, I also didn't want to be a buzzkill. I knew Ivy would be super bummed, so I convinced myself that nothing would happen anyway since nothing happened the first time. Once again, we started our chant, calling forth any spirit to come forth and speak with us to let their presence be known. And when we were done, I sat there again waiting for something to happen. And when nothing happened again, I stopped feeling so scared. I started feeling silly. How did I convince myself that any of this was real? What were we thinking? We were just a couple of teenagers talking to some candles. The candle's flames didn't move. No strange temperature changes happened. No tapping or knocking noises occurred. Just silence. Just nothing. I let go of a breath that I didn't even know I was holding. In addition to feeling silly, I felt relief rush over me. Then I looked over in the mirror at myself. I initially felt more relief as my reflection stared back at me exactly like it was supposed to. Then I glanced over at the space in the mirror where Ivy's reflection was, and her reflection seemed normal too. Mostly. Wait. She was looking back from the mirror, as if her head was turned toward it. Why did something feel off? The reason hit me like I'd been punched in the gut. It felt wrong because Ivy was not looking towards the mirror. She was facing me, only her reflection was turned towards her. I began to shiver uncontrollably as fear pounded through every part of my body. This isn't real, I thought. My mind's playing tricks on me. The face in the mirror now turned towards me. Ivy's did not. Its mouth curved into a sneer I'll never forget. The mouth in the mirror began to move, and I heard what it said inside my head. Hello. <gasps> We're here. The candles flickered violently, and then they were snuffed out, casting the room in complete darkness. I hoped to see or hear something, but holy shit, not this. I felt sick I was so scared. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't for some reason. Then as I sat there in the dark, I started to hear scurrying noises <gasps> all around me. I couldn't tell where they were coming from or what was there with us. Every nerve in my body felt like it was humming as adrenaline surged through my blood. I could now hear myself whimpering as if I were listening to someone else. Ivy was whimpering too. I felt warm liquid in my crutch. I was so scared I was literally pissing myself. Then I felt a slight breeze as something got close to me as it shuffled by. I reached out in front of me, trying to feel for the familiar shapes in my room as I began to crawl blindly forward. The fear I felt grew even more. I should have ran into Ivy almost immediately as I crawled forward, but now she wasn't where she was supposed to be. I ended up crawling farther than my room was long. Where was Ivy? Where was I? Finally, I felt something solid in front of me, but not Ivy. The sheets on my bed, maybe? No, not my sheets. My sheets aren't greasy and cold. Ooh. 
I pulled my hand back and now a slick substance clung to my fingers. Then a slight breeze tickled the fine hairs around my ear and I heard a sound like wet sucking noises coming from behind me. Whatever was in my room was right next to me inches from the back of my head. I felt like I was hearing it breathe. The smell of rotten eggs filled the room and I gagged from the smell. My breath shuddered as I inhaled and I bit my lip trying to keep from crying out. And then the breathing drew back away from me and my ear and the room became silent. I still hadn't heard any noise from Ivy and I couldn't see her. I turned my head from side to side, straining to hear the slightest noise, but I couldn't make out anything in the void that now filled what used to be my room. I can picture the next moment so clearly. I wish I couldn't. I still couldn't scream for some reason. It's like I couldn't fill my lungs with enough air. My chest was too tight. I wanted to get out of my room, but I didn't know which way I needed to go. It was too dark. Lost, I began to crawl in a random direction, desperate to find the door. I swung my hand back and forth in an arc, trying to find the wall, my bed, anything. Finally, my hand came into contact with something solid. I ran it across its surface, and I realized I had found one of the walls in my bedroom. Using it as a guide, I followed it, moving slowly, brushing my fingers against it to remain on course, while my other hand prodded forward into the dark. I'd hoped to find the door, but instead, I bumped my hand against another wall and found myself in one of the corners of my bedroom. I wedged myself into the corner so at least I didn't have to worry about what was behind me and I could face the emptiness in front of me. And then out in that emptiness, I heard movement. Something was coming towards me. I wanted to scream. I wanted to cry. It didn't sound like this thing was on the floor with me this time. It sounded like it was up on the wall or maybe on the ceiling above me. Whatever this thing was, it felt like it knew I was cornered. It moved slowly and methodically, taking its time like it was enjoying itself and I had nowhere to run. I was trapped in that corner, and it was coming closer, closer. Then the sound of movement stopped. It felt like it must be right in front of me. I wasn't about to reach out and check. The room around me now was incredibly silent and still. I focused everything I had on trying to hear where it was. Then, from somewhere above me, a cold, wet drip hit my forward oh. and slid down the side of my face. A cold dread spread throughout me. It was right above me. Finally, in an act of desperation, I bolted from the corner and I just ran towards where I hoped the door was. I stumbled and almost fell as I rushed in a blind panic towards where I hoped was safety. I crashed into the wall, flailed my arms across it, looking for the door in my escape. Thankfully, my hand bumped into the doorframe and I quickly scrambled to find the knob. I twisted hard and threw myself out into the hall, falling down and landing hard on my elbow and hip. I looked back where I'd just come from, the light from the hallway barely illuminating my room, but there was enough light to see a large, dark, largely shapeless shadow floating near the ceiling by my door. Mm. And then it moved over to the mirror and seemed to be absorbed by it, traveling inside of it. I slowly stood and walked back to the door. Ivy was still in there. I didn't want to leave her. I quickly reached my hand around the corner, flipped the switch in the wall, bathing the room in light, and saw Ivy lying on the floor near where she'd been when the lights went out. I rushed over to her, rolled her over on her back. I saw she had several red welts all over her arms, legs, and across her face. She moaned weakly and opened her eyes to me. Ivy, oh my God, are you okay? All I got was a slight nod, yes, and then she cringed as if even that caused her a great deal of pain. Whatever was in that room had hurt her. I lifted her slowly onto the bed and got her situated so she'd be as comfortable as possible. And I did not sleep at all the rest of the night. I kept a light on numerous lights. I got all the flashlights I could find, kept them nearby. And I covered that mirror with blankets, worrying the whole time I did that that thing was about to reach out and grab me and pull me in with it. When Ivy woke up the next morning, she was sore, but the welts had faded. We spent the morning online finding a new ritual, one that was supposed to banish evil spirits. We performed it hoping that it would get rid of whatever had attacked us the night before, and maybe it did. It happened over six months ago, and I'm pleased to report I haven't come into contact with my tormentor from that night ever again. Also, I convinced my mom to let me wallpaper my mirrored closet doors. She only agreed because she got sick of me continually covering them with blankets. I've, cr I've tried to contact spirits. I have not tried to contact spirits or anything else of this world since, or not of this world since that night, and neither has Ivy. Never again. What we thought would be fun and exciting ended up being worse than the most terrible nightmare. I don't expect anyone to believe this story, but it happened. We didn't dream it. It wasn't our imagination. I felt it. I heard it. Ivy was actually attacked and hurt by it. I don't know about Ivy, but I don't think I'll ever be able to be alone in a dark room with a mirror ever again. Ooh, it's such a I, creepy atmosphere, that story. So fucking creepy. And just like the, the thought of... 
I was picturing her crawling on the floor, like one hand in front of her, one hand on the wall, just kind of yeah. like little like on, on her knees, like yeah. right, like little like a step step. Okay, 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 safe. Okay, and I agreed with her, like getting into that corner. But oh then, right. Then I just thought about like <sighs> right, but like across the ceiling, uh, and just yeah. like. Fuck. Because you have, there's nothing you can do. If it's on the ceiling and, oh my God. and you go to bolt, it like a goes big with spider you. Or something. Yes. Oh, God. That was a lot of creeps. Yeah. And, and a little different. It had like different elements in some of the stories where it's like it wasn't a humanoid shape. It wasn't, you know, there was a voice oh, once. Yeah, I guess but not. Not again. It was just a. Uh, Odd, like, yeah. and, and then, like, that's a, I can't think of another one we've told here where, like, somebody touched something and felt a I know, almost like a specific. viscous, greasy slime kind I of know. thing. Yeah, yeah, um, I, there's no pictures associated with the story, you know, completely anonymous. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but looking for like creepy mirror pics, oh boy, pics, I found a couple gifts actually. Uh, and I, th- these are the best two I found, and these will be in our oh, look at that, look at that as she runs by. Ugh. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, not sure what movie this is from. Ugh. And then, and then we have one more and these will be, uh, on, you know, scared to death podcast, uh, Instagram, Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. What you got? Did oh, you see that Yeah. It, t- it takes a second to load up gifts oh, oh, uh, oh, as oh. opposed to like pictures. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> is this a joke? Uh, nope. Then. Oh God. That is fucking terrifying. No, thank you. Yeah, because she doesn't even know that that's happening. I know. And that's such a fear, too. Think about that, like, just for chills. You, you're in your bathroom, wherever, you don't see anything at all, and then you leave, and your reflection, instead of reflecting the back of your head, yeah. turns around to face you. And it's, and it's you, but not a good version of you watching you leave. If I saw, That would put me in an institution if I saw that happen to somebody. Well, I I was, would, my brain would be done. On, on that particular story, I just kept thinking, and this is why we don't fuck around with this shit, Dan. Like, you're like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, I want to do a Ouija board. I wanna, it's like, that's all you need mm-hmm. is for that to happen. And as, and as creepy as that tale is next week, because I've been working uh, ahead on some stories. Yeah. There's another summoning story. It's a different kind that I've, I've never heard of this type of summoning ritual. Yeah. And it creeped me out even more than this one. So I have like these double stories in my head that are similar as far as summoning, but very different Mm -hmm. in far as like how the ritual is carried out. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. I've been feeling really good about my ability to control things. Mm -hmm. Like um, I was working with Monique uh, Mm -hmm. on just, so I was in New Orleans recently with my dad. Yeah. And, you know, it's a very haunted place so many Mm -hmm. of the places you know and we stayed in this hotel that's in a very old building and blah 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 i was nervous on a variety of levels to be there because it's like a i was traveling alone more or less right i didn't have you like in the hotel with me and i just my imagination can get the better of me and yes i did sleep with a little bit of light on I, i i took some precautions like that but i worked with monique about like grounding myself feeling out the energy in a room how to decipher the good from the bad, how to get rid of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm a fucking pro now. Okay. I feel like, okay, I know how to, because the one thing that she and I discussed was that you are in control always, 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 always. So So you should do the summoning ritual. No, that's all the more reason for me not to, because I am such an empath. Like I do feel things so deeply. I am so open to it that even though I feel like I could rid myself of it, and I could, I feel that I really, really could. It would take a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. It would take a lot of work. And I, it's not like you just forget that that happened. Oh, yeah. Right? You might be able to get it off of you, away from you, sever that connection. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean you forget what you fucking saw. Yeah. And that is, I don't need that. I don't need that rolling no, around thanks. in my imagination. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, no on the Ouija board, Dan. That's a big, <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, man. I know, but I get that. It's it's interesting. I, like like a lot of those stories, they have a similar arc, which makes total sense. Where it starts starts off, and people are like, obviously, you're doing that because you're like, oh, it'd be really cool if we saw something. Yeah, like, everyone's and I would have the curious. same I get curiosity. That. Yeah, and, and then <laughs> so often, and again, this makes sense. Then the people are like, okay, then we started to see or hear something, and then it was like, fuck this, right? So it is a thing where it's like you want to see, but then as soon as you see it, like, okay, now go away, right? But but then but it's like, even if it goes away, you can't. You can't unknow things. Mm-hmm. I sort of, this is 
a ridiculous comparison, but I kind of think of it this way. Yeah. When you're dating someone and it's early on in the relationship and you're having the talk about how many partners you've had, <laughs> you uh, a yeah. lot of people are like think they want to know. Right. And then you find out and you wish you didn't know because you can't stop thinking about that. You you can't unknow that. You right. can't unknow the experiences that someone has had with yeah. someone else. And if you a thousand. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> well, oh, no, that's fine. That's nothing. I got you beat, so it's fine. A hundred thousand. <laughs> Still beat. That's a lot of do work. You want, do you want to keep playing that game? That's so much work. Or so much fun. <laughs> but yes, I know but what you're yeah, saying. But it's that kind of thing where it's like, you know, it, it just... Your imagination will get the best of you. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if, yeah. you ha- if you are with someone, if you're... If you've been with five people and they've been with twenty, yeah. you're like, well, what what were those twenty experiences, and how mm-hmm. can I how can I compete with that? How can I compare with that? And it can eat away at you. And to me, yeah. it's very similar in the paranormal space where it's like you think you want this experience and you have it, and that I just don't think it's going to be enough. I think you're constantly going to think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, what if this would have happened? What if that would have happened? What if it was this? What if it was that? Was it good? Was it evil? Did it mean to cause me harm? Is it my grandma? Is it you know something I don't know? I, it, it's too I know. many variables. Like in this situation, you could never get that little moment of like hello oh my god we're here i know <laughs> the dripping wet ah! that yeah. that was the drip onto her forehead mm-hmm. what why was it peeing on her was it spitting on her is it a wet thing like it's is it like swampy it a, i interpret it as a wet thing but yeah i know it felt swampy to me Eek. Ah, okay. Well, let's get some more spoopies on. Okay. Um, okay, so this, I don't know. Have we been to a haunted nursing home? No, we've had, in one of the stories I told, a woman went into a nursing home. I'm 99% sure it was that one in San Francisco where the lady was um, starting to suffer from dementia. I thought oh, that, no, was, she that died was in, her in home. home care. That was you're right. That was in home care. So there was like a nurse there, right? A couple of care, them, full time yeah. care, but it was not in a nursing home. I know. Maybe we haven't been in a nursing home yet. Have you yourself ever been in a nursing home? Not committed, but just say, <laughs> uh, God, I, I had to. I I don't know. I mean, it would have had. I mean, both. Your grandfather was not. Your grandmother was not. So then, like, if your great grandparents, Uh I don't think so, actually. And I mean, and sometimes people go to nursing homes for like rehab if they're of a certain right, age and right. they have, you know, like hip replacement or whatever. I, this is so stupid, but I feel like I've seen so many movies that are set there. Mm-hmm. I started to like transpose <laughs> my own memories. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that, no, that was a movie. <laughs> no, that's a TV show. <laughs> oh, no, that's a movie. Uh, nope. Okay. Well, my, my grandma Tilly, who mm-hmm. potentially haunts us here, um, she passed away at a nursing home and I remember going to visit her at the nursing home and to me they're just inherently creepy they're just I'm sure that there are really good ones really nice ones I know that there's a variety of levels of care and I I know that nursing homes get a bad rap they're not all terrible but it just kind of creeped me out because it's just like a hospital but like more relaxed right well and it has a sense of finality right where it's like you're going there to spend your last days so so you know compared to any other type of place you're gonna visit you know like hospice type care like play yeah it's like death is close Mm -hmm. but and you can't not be aware of that but close could be years some Mm -hmm. people go into care like in a care facility because um they are of a certain age and they should no longer be driving Right. So they the the family decides that this is the best thing for mom or dad or whomever because you know they left their memory is not great. Mm-hmm. Right? Not even necessarily Alzheimer's, they're just older and things don't work the way they used to. Yeah. So you can go to a nursing home uh uh what do they call it? Um not extended care, assisted living. Mm. You can end up there and early, that can be yeah, like early. a step even before a nursing home. We should do that with my dad just cuz it'd be fun. Be f- just see how then, we react. And then like, we know where he is. Then we know where he is. You know, we know what he's up to. Yeah. Just, we'll just try and let's sign off, get him committed. Uh, he's totally able-bodied, mm-hmm. but it'd be pretty entertaining pretty- just to see how angry he would get. At- he does have a temper, <laughs> which would Kyler just found out he has your dad's temper. I know. I have it. He has it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we had the whole talk of like, oh, this is not going to serve you well in life. Nope, nope, nope. All right, let, let's get into this. Okay. I have three brothers, my mom and my dad. We grew up in an old house in rural Minnesota. This house had to have been at least a hundred years old, but it was cute from from the time for the times and came with land for my dad to start his hobby farm. My mom when, my mom, when we were all still pretty little, was working night shift as a nurse to, and going to school to further her nursing degree. 
She had always been a believer in the paranormal, but never used it to voice, never used to voice it until things started getting really funky. After she finished getting her RN, she started working at a newly renovated nursing home. Nursing homes are inherently creepy. I used to work as one, as a CNA, and after doing one mandated night shift, I noped the hell out of that. <laughs> but this nursing home she was working at, little did we know, would be the start of a currently ongoing attachment. It all started mm. in the first few nights my mom was working the night shift. Her night would consist of doing rounds to each room and around the floor to make sure everyone is asleep and or repositioning those who needed it. However, there was one room, the gathering room, that when my mom would walk by it, she would get the feeling of eyes watching her. She would always speed walk past without looking in the direction of the room. One night, she decided to take her digital camera with her to work. As I said earlier, she watched a lot of ghost investigation shows, so she thought it would be a good idea to replicate what they do and try to catch it on camera. Hmm. As she walked by the room this night, she can't manage to get herself to look into the room, so she looks away and snaps a few pictures as she walks by. She did this a couple of different times that night. The first few pictures didn't really have anything on them, just some blurry spots, which she chalked up to her moving too quickly or something like that. She didn't think anything of it. She waited to check the rest of the pictures until she got home the next morning as she got busy and had to do her charting before the end of her shift. This is where I come into play. When she woke up the next morning, she pulled out the camera at the kitchen table. She stops at one picture, brings it closer to her face to study it. She then flipped to the next picture, gasped loudly, dropped the camera, and cupped her face in her hands. I grabbed the camera at this point to look for myself. In the first photo, you can see very clearly the face and body of a woman dressed in an old gown with the head cover, kind of like what Amish women wear. Mm -hmm. This apparition is floating above the couch, arms by her side, and you can see her brows furrowed and mouth frowning in disapproval. Creepy Yes, but me being a skeptic, I tried to, tried to blame it on car headlights shining through the window. I flipped to the second photo. The woman's face is now inches from the camera, her mouth wide open as if she was screaming, her eyes wide with fury, and her arms raised above her head as if she's trying to scare my mom away. That creeped me the hell out. I put the camera down and told my mom to delete them and hope to God nothing comes from this. She did not delete them. She took the camera to work with her on her next shift to show her colleagues. Little did she know, even though I was about 10 years old, I was more right than she ever could have imagined. After showing her colleagues the pictures that night at work and thoroughly spooping out one colleague to the point where she quit the next day, my mom was walking down the hall again, but this time she had her coworker walking with her and they were talking. My mom suddenly stopped looked around as she started to feel super uneasy, like something was following closely behind them. The stethoscope around her neck was suddenly yanked from her neck so hard it snapped back into her and then flew across the room onto the floor. Thoroughly freaking out, she, in some weird mindset, thought it would be a good idea to take her male coworker into the room to tell whatever this thing was to leave her alone. The activity after that dwindled down to mere shadows in the corner of her eyes and faint voices echoing off in the distance. Nothing major happened until the incident with the pilgrim boy. My younger brothers, who were eight and six at the time, were goofing around in the living room. One was sleeping up against the TV as was leaning up against the TV as if to stop my youngest brother from changing the channel as they often did to annoy each other. My youngest brother grabbed my mom's digital camera to take a video of what my brother was doing. In the video, you can see him pan the living room in a quick sweep, like he's spinning in a circle. However, I was big into photography at this time, so I was very in tune with the camera. I saw the video, and while my brother was spinning around, he captured the entire living room. Behind the, behind the reclining chair was a small boy. His hand was on the headrest, and he wore the same attire as the Amish-looking woman from the nursing home. Nobody else was home but me and my two younger brothers, and this boy was literally two or three feet tall. Nobody in our house was that young. 
The following has not gone away in the last 19 years. It has been there in the background to my mom waking up and hearing someone or something speaking to her and calling her name, realizing that the sound came from on top of the fridge. I have been chased up the stairs and small occurrences like this have happened over the years. My parents have now moved to a much nicer and newer home still in the same area, but just a few miles down the road. My younger brother and his girlfriend, M, were living in the basement. They had just had their first child, E, and were trying to save money. Like most mothers do in the first few months, the new baby's crib was in the same room as theirs next to the bed. Once M laid E down for a nap, they then crawled into uh, she then crawled into bed. Once M laid E down for a nap, then crawled into bed next to her to sleep herself. M awoke in a half coherent, half not manner, so she wasn't really ready to lift herself up yet when E started to fuss. M, trying to wake herself up from this half-sleep state, heard E, but she also heard the soft hum from an, from an older woman, which calmed E down, and she went back to sleep. M could still hear the humming and thought it was really weird and that she must be dreaming, or that her mom had went back down to check on them and decided to comfort E back to sleep. Except there was no one else home at this time, and when M realized this, she jumped up to check E, only to find a pacifier in E's mouth. The pacifier had been on the dresser a few feet away from the crib prior to them lying down for their nap. A short while after this, we moved my grandpa into my parents' home as he was no longer able to live on his own. When my mom works, I go over there to help our grandpa. One day, my grandpa's dog, Cody, and my dog, Tucker, were just chilling out in the living room while I was checking on grandpa. Suddenly, Cody let out a yelp for no discernible reason and ran and hid in a corner. Seconds later, Tucker jumped up and growled, a sound I had no idea my eight-pound dog could make. A few days later, my mom sees him. She was doing the dishes in the kitchen. There is a long hallway leading to my grandpa's room, and from behind her, she got the familiar feeling of being watched. She quickly turned around and saw a man pressed up against the wall as if he was hugging it. He had no head, just a torso and arms, and was hovering high enough to where he appeared to be about six feet tall. As she watched, the shape scooted back into the shadows of the hallway like he was scaling a cliff. To this day, there are many more smaller incidents that I could go on and on about, but this story is already long enough. Suffice to say, whatever it was has not gone away. And my question is, why has it followed us for 19 years? How many are there? And what did my mom unleash that night by simply taking a few pictures? Huh. So... I'm trying to remember if I, if I have this right. When she took those pictures, uh, the two the two pictures with the, the lady yeah. uh, with the kind of Amish kind of headdress a little ways away and then like rah, like coming towards her, were those pictures taken at the nursing home? Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. Because yeah. that's what she showed the coworker. The coworker yeah. uh, left the next day. And then at the nursing home, she has the stethoscope uh -huh. pulled from her. And so it sounds like before those things happened, nothing happened at nope. their house. No, nothing so, ever happened to them at all. Right. Period. It happened at all. And then after that, 19 years of uh -huh. incidents at the actual house. At the house. So she thinks her mom brought something back with her. Yeah. And, and, and I wonder. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I wonder. She doesn't say this. If she says that there's other incidents, but I couldn't figure out when her parents got the new, more modern house. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're continuing to have things. Yes, because she talks oh. about her brother and sister-in-law having yeah. a baby and they're living in Oh, and that's all at the new house. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, okay, yes. okay, okay. And, and the floating torso. Right. That's all at the new house. That's, that's all at the, the new house. That was really creepy. The thing like like Cliff uh, scaling the wall. I was getting some weird visuals uh -huh. of that thing like moving down the wall. I know. A headless torso. Yeah, so I mean that ugh, that is like um, creepy, where that you could pick something up somewhere uh -huh. and bring it with you into your family, and they could follow you wherever you go after that. Well, yeah, because it's like, is it? For me, I initially thought like, is it attached to her? Then I thought like, is it somehow like in the camera? Like, how is there some way that you can like capture it and then that transports? Like, if she still it? has that same. Oh, I like mean, she to, may not have it now, but, but to like, bring it initially back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I thought that maybe uh. the little boy, which she called him like the pilgrim boy. Um, a little two foot tall guy. Yeah, a little yeah. tiny kid. But was he, if he looked pilgrim esque, and the woman at the nursing home looked Amish esque? You know, just for a lack of descriptive terms. Were they in the same family? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I thought. I thought mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, is this a whole family? Did you bring a whole family home? That that's where my brain went. Headless dad. <laughs> well, maybe. He, I mean, you know, we don't know what his garb was, so it's like yeah. there's a chance that they could have 
he could have been murdered and the mom witnessed it. I don't know. They could have been raped and pillaged. I mean, who knows? That, that all just made me think of like Beetlejuice for some reason, like the couple, yeah. uh, you know, that are like married in life yeah, yeah. and they're up in the attic ghosts, uh, you know, hanging out in that one house. With yeah, the other family. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that was a good creepy story, though. It definitely gave me the chills. I know, I know. Um, and this next story really got me going. You know how, like, sometimes you'll think that just, like, your eyes are playing tricks on you? Oh, you, yeah. You look mm-hmm. and you are you are certain that you see X. Mm-hmm. You're like, I definitely see that. And then you kind of blink a time or two and you're like, oh, no. Right. I clearly. Yeah. But what if, upon further investigation, you did see what you thought you saw? Like you rub your eyes, like oh, no, yeah, and, then, and, and then you look back, and it's the uh-huh. exact same thing that you were, made you rub your eyes in the first place. I mean, yeah, that'd be terrible. That'd be terrible. And what if, like, as a parent, sometimes we lie to our kids and we keep things from our kids. What if our kid was like, "I think I see something," and you look and you definitely see it, like you can verify that it's there. Would you confirm it or deny it? Ooh. I, it depends on what it was. Okay. If it was a certain level of terrifying and depending on the age of the kid, yeah, there definitely would be times when I'd be like, nope, I don't see it. And they're like, hey, let's go. You know, yeah, like, oh, like, whatever, brush it off. Yeah, yeah, like trying, like, because uh, kids, like, look to you so much mm-hmm. in situations of, like, how afraid should I be? Yes. And I wouldn't want to induce panic. Okay. And maybe I would tell them later, but maybe not because you also don't, like, torture someone with nightmares. Mm-hmm. If you can convince them that what they saw just wasn't there and save them. A lifetime of fear, I think that's a pretty noble choice. I, I agree with that because I also think, too, like, if you lie to your kids about something like that, mm-hmm. my initial thought is that they'll immediately think, what else have you lied to me about? So I just think that, like, if you tell them that it's not there and mm-hmm. then later in life you're like, actually, then they'll be like, well, you fucking lied oh, about that. What so else have gotcha. you lied to me about? So if you're going to make that lie initially, you got to hold it forever. Yep. But then there's that thing, just before we go into it, what if um, you say like, no, I didn't see anything. And then years later, they're still like, God, it made me feel crazy. I swear. Well, that's I a s- different thing. If they bring then it up. Then you're like, okay. Yeah. I didn't want to scare you. Yeah. Because I think that's that's a very specific situation. Yeah. Where it's like, I would normally not lie to you, but I was so worried about like how terrified that would make you. Also, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life not sleeping while you lived in this house. Yep. That's a real thing with parents. Sure. Sleep is precious. (laughs) Sure, yeah. All right, well, let's uh, check out what these kids saw and how their parents handled it. Okay. Hey, Dan, Lindsay, and the rest of the Scared to Death production team. I love this show, and when I heard you guys were accepting stories, I knew I had to send you a message. I've dealt with a lot of supernatural occurrences in my life, and so I figured I would start with the first truly significant one. Here's my story titled, The Man in the Tree. I was nine years old and my sister was 12. My parents had gone out to dinner and left us home alone. After we finished with our chores, we decided to spend our time watching TV and playing video games. As older siblings do, my sister had taken control of the TV and changed it to something I didn't particularly enjoy, so I started messing around with random things in the house. After a while, I made my way to the big window that we had in the front of the house to see if my mom and dad were home yet. When I looked out, I saw something that didn't really make sense to me leaning against my neighbor's tree. I couldn't really figure out what it was, but I was really scared for some reason. I turned on the porch light and saw that it was a man's body leaning against the tree. The angle and the position of the man made it clear that he was not alive. I started to freak out and my sister came over thinking my claims of a body, a body were totally ridiculous. But when she came over and looked, she saw it too. We of course lost our ever loving shit. We were blowing up our parents' phones trying to get the, trying to get a hold of them because we just didn't know what to do. After calling them and telling them what we were seeing about four times, my parents finally decided that they had to come home since we were being hysterical. They didn't believe a word we had said, but they came home anyway. They laid into us about how ridiculous we were being, but we finally talked our dad into looking out the window. As soon as my dad went to the window, he said something that made my blood run cold. He looked at my mom and said, Corey, you may have to call the cops. The kids are right. My mom stopped dead in her tracks. They went out and looked at the tree and came back in. They told us that it was just our imaginations running wild, that the body wasn't real, and it was just a weirdly shaped tree. They wouldn't let us look out the window, though. Over the years, I just completely accepted what I was told that night. However, I was talking to my parents about it a few months ago, and I learned that they only told us that to keep us from being terrified. Mm -hmm. Apparently, when they went outside, they could clearly see the body, facial features, body size, and gender. But as they got closer and closer, the body started to simply fade away. 
They were absolutely sure about what they had seen, but knowing how much it would scare us, they kept it a secret from us for almost 12 years. What the hell was that? Just a weird, like, sh- like apparition of a dead body that doesn't move, doesn't communicate, just leaned up against a tree that stays there for what seems like, I'm guessing, an hour or two. Yeah, it and, was there for a long time. And then when they went there up close, then it dissipates. That is weird. Because for a second there, before the dissipation part, I, I was thinking, like, what if what they were hiding from you is like, oh, yeah. The neighbors killed some, or like you know, like like there actually was a dead body there. Yeah, but obviously that wouldn't make sense for the story. But that that's uh, I had a creepy pervert thought. I was like, oh, oh, like a peeper, like some uh some pedo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, creepy, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, creepy that four people. Yeah, four people over a few hours saw the same thing. And then it just... Because I was thinking poof. it was like, like trees can look pretty yes. at night. You know, they can like, you can, your minds can play tricks with you. Like you were saying yeah. earlier, and with a tree, you absolutely can think you see like, oh, that's definitely the shape of a guy. And it is the shape of a guy. Mm-hmm. In but the distance, the shadow. Yeah, but then you yeah. get close, you're like, oh, that's just some branches. But uh-huh. nope. Or so you think. All this time, you've thought it's just your mind playing tricks on you. What if it's not? Right. Those instances where you don't go investigate and don't go look closer and just tell yourself, like, oh, that was just a tree. Right. And, your, it wasn't. and your eyes, like, don't ever really kind of come into focus. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you're just kind of like, yeah, okay. But you just brush it off because your logical brain is like, can't be. Yeah. Could be. Could be. Okay. By complete happenstance, yeah. this story is also about... Same kind of eyes. Same kind of thing. Like, you think you see something. But what's creepy about this story is that it... Also, it was verified by two friends, and then it's gone, but it apparently comes back. It's Hmm. it's a weird, it has a weird twist at the end, I think. Okay. Hello, master of creepers and the mistress of peepers from the great white north, eh? (laughs) I've been a fan of dance comedy for a few years and just found out about Scared to Death, and I've been cranking it nonstop at work to get through the days. Thank you. After debating if I should or should not send this in, I have decided to tell you a tale. When I was about 9 or 10, I lived next to my best friend, Matt, who was the same age as me in a duplex. This was in a small town on the edge of Lake Erie, about 30 minutes from Windsor, Ontario. He was the borderline stereotype of a cool kid, and I was his nerdy, imaginative (laughs) ginger sidekick. Our home layouts mirrored one another. We both were on the top floor, facing the backyards and Main Street. There was an old dirt lot behind our duplex, but with recent development, it became a new and improved mega drugstore. While we kids were bummed we lost our dirt lot to ride bikes in, we were excited to have a new parking lot to skateboard, scooter, and rollerblade in. Soon enough, it was built, and we were being chased off. After a long day of playing out in the sun and by the lake, me and my friend were biking back home at twilight, and we were cutting through the small parking lot of the drugstore, when something caught my eye. I stopped and looked into the large, dark windows, only illuminated by a few interior security lights over the pharmacy. I saw three yellow dots in a triangular pattern blinking in and out of existence at the back of the store. I was the easily scared one, so I froze in my spot. Matt came over and asked what was wrong, and I just pointed as the lights moved again. He laughed at me for being scared at security sensors until a dark shadow moved from one shelf to another. Uh. We both screamed and took off back to our houses. That night, I woke up to get a drink of water. It was pitch black out, save for the bit of moonlight. I stopped, and as I passed my window, feeling compelled by fear to look outside. In the moonlight, I saw a large shadow crouching upon the post that splits our backyards in half. It seemed to be staring at Matt's house. I stayed there watching it until its head snapped into my direction, and I saw the same yellow triangle lights looking back at me. I couldn't scream. I was so terrified. Then it jumped off the fence and into the lot and moved back towards the drugstore. The next day, I saw Matt, and he was solemn and quiet. But by lunch, he was back to his normal self, and the events slowly faded from my mind, and as I knew Matt wouldn't tell a soul for his reputation— and no one would believe the kid who enjoyed stories and tall tales so much. The summer came, and I ended up moving away from the little town, and the years separated me from Matt, and the story faded entirely. We are Facebook friends, but Mm -hmm. haven't interacted much. I ended up moving across Canada several years ago for work, but recently I saw that he had welcomed a child into his home. Of course, I sent him the standard congratulations and well wishes. He saw it and gave it a like, and that was it. I knew he'd be busy, but I didn't mind. But then... A few days later, 
Matt messaged me, and we exchanged shallow conversation until he asked me one single question. Do you remember the yellow-eyed shadow? And like a light switch, the fear came rushing back. The one from the drugstore? Yeah, why? Several minutes went by before he replied. I used to think it was maybe some stupid story you'd gotten into my head. Until last night. I saw something last night. I went to check on my kid, and through the window, I saw three yellow dots looking in like they were looking at her crib. When it looked back at me, its eyes bobbed and vanished. It wasn't the first time I've seen it since that night. If I ever get more info, I'll be sure to keep you posted. Your friend from the North. Uh, for some reason, during that story, I started thinking about um, that simulated reality kind of theory that some people believe oh, in. Oh, yeah. That we're all essentially in some super advanced Sims game. You know, right. and, and that this is all like a kind of a matrix type situation. And then I was just picturing the people who are controlling the the program or the algorithm being like, mm, let's rev up a little bit of uh, uh, terror over here and let's give like this family an entity. <laughs> oh, and, like, my <laughs> oh, my God. Like if there could be some sadistic teenager uh, who is just controlling our reality. That'd be awful. Terrible. And being like, mm, let's ramp up a little bit, bit of insanity here. Let's have this person see a fucking demon in the mirror. It's and like see West how that World. affects Right. Actually. Uh, yeah. When is that show coming back? I don't know. But that would suck. That would suck. To see that with your friend as a kid and then forget about it. Yeah, like, year, I mean, they were like 10 and what he's probably like, mm, I don't know, probably what, 30, 35, yeah, 40, exactly. anywhere in that range. So 20 to 30 years later. Yeah. To have that thing like. I'm, I'm back and not only back but back and looking like it wants his kid there is something yeah. about that element of like demons ghosts whatever mm -hmm. being interested in children mm -hmm. that always because as a parent you want to protect them mm -hmm. you know and and kids are more open to it so it seems you right the the veil is thinner there for them they they just don't have the same sort of uh you know predetermined feelings about it if you were an entity that feasted on terror in some horrible oh way you know kids would probably make a better better target absolutely can... and they can't communicate mm -hmm. a baby like and now it makes me often think More defenseless yeah and i just think about like you know friends with infants that are colicky i'm like are they colicky or is there oh a fucking god. demon oh my god well that's like it shows up in so many horror movies for a reason right where it's like there's the crib i think about the security monitor footage oh. which always gets me where it's Every like time. yep you're clicking over like looking at that little security monitor of the crib and then all of a sudden bah! Something like comes into the room. It's like, yes. no, thank you. Of course your kid's crying. It's fucking terrifying. Hello, we're here. Drip, drip. Bleah. Yikes. You get this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In your kid's room. Mm -hmm. Too I, much. I got a lot of chills today. I know. I know. I feel like uh, I might have a little rough time sleeping tonight. But mm. I'm just going to do what I've been taught to do, how to deal with it. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to take it with me. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I mean, I can't know what I know right now, but I know that it's not attached to me because mm -hmm. I didn't let it. Yep. Yep. We got to stay in control. Got to stay in control. <laughs> Crystals help too. <laughs> Uh, do you have anything else to add on the story or do you want to thank our Annabelles? No, you can. Do you want to go first? I can go first. go first. I can go first. Okay, have at it. Uh, thank you to Annabelle's Andy Wynn, Von Trips, Finn High, Sarah North, Brad Caffey or Caff. Probably Caffey because there's two E's. Katie Lee, Kristen Wilson, Daniel Hutchinson, Taryn Morales, Samantha Otis, uh, Kaylin. Kaylin Fisher, uh, Heather Butler, Karen Fisher, Jenny Metzger, and Ellie Zalio. Good job. I thought they were pretty easy ones this week. Yeah, yeah. There was uh, there was only one the the win, but I'm I'm pretty confident on that one. The N G U Y E N. Mm -hmm. I think that's pronounced win. Okay, good job. I would like to thank the following Annabelles: Joshua Mashad, Lily Moon one one two three, and I think I know who this is from Instagram interactions. Like you know how you like build a picture mm -hmm. and you're kind of like, oh, if it's you, I know who you are. Uh, Nick Van Ryan, Selena Green, Mandy Brighton, Kelly Y. Amy Gran, Matthew Myers, Chris Leggett, Cruz, no last name, Ashley Collier. Okay, this, I, I don't know. It's A-G-I-I-I. -I -I. Aggie? A guy? A, a G? Guy? I'm, I'm, mm. I apologize. 
Um, How many eyes? Two or three? Three. And it could also be the way that it comes through. I'm like, was it three lowercase L's? But Agle also. Yeah. So I'm really sorry if I butchered that one. I, I was very confused. I've never seen that one. Amanda Caldwell, Samantha Fisk, Billy Lawson, and Daniel Brown. And then, of course, I have some shout outs. outs. To Kendall from Kamisha, I love you. To Michaela Catherine from your mom, Rochelle, happy 18th birthday. To Casey from Morgan, I love you, sister, and good luck in grad school. To Nicole from Trey, happy fifth anniversary. To Amanda from Cody, you are the best and brattiest sister ever. And to Amanda from Sarah, happy birthday, BFF. Aww. This is real cute, this sister, Casey and Morgan. Um, Morgan's going to grad school, and it's been this like whole situation for Morgan where she was like going to grad school here, and then something happened. Like it maybe it was a smaller school, and they lost their funding or something, okay. or her program got shut down. Yeah. And so then she had to start over. And then she uh. starts over here, and then I want to say they had like a parent pass away like something Man. awful happened and it's like motherfuckers then you drop out of the program and then this I, this is like the third or fourth time back yeah it's like, I love it I love that resilience mm. because Tenacity. it's like not everyone can do that so mm -hmm. good for you and mm -hmm. good luck yes uh, and that is all for today uh, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com you can email us for everything else info at scared to death podcast.com Thanks to Logan Keith for running BadMagicMerch.com and our social media accounts, along with Liz Hernandez at Scared to Death Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, where you'll find pictures that correspond to the episodes and more. Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Thank you to Zach Cohen for creating the custom sound beds. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And thanks to Olivia Lee for finding and gathering details for the first story I told today. And to Sarah Finch for finding and gathering details for the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the shows and sign up to be a uh, Robert or Annabelle on Patreon if you want additional monthly content. And and actually, um, now that I'm saying that, I, I am going to backtrack. I'm sorry. I wrote it. Uh, uh, Olivia Lee on the first story and it was um, Sophie Evans on the second. How dare you? So I you? carried this. So, uh, sorry. Oh, how... Sarah has a story coming up next week. Sophie had this one today. I you're corrected fired. it. You're fired. I corrected it. You're fired. Before it was too late. Nope, nope, you're fired. Uh, subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the shows. Sign up to be Robert or Annabelle on Patreon if you want additional monthly content. And then quick reminder, volume two of the Scared to Death book of true ho horror short stories, all fan submissions, available for pre-order. Badmagicmerch.com, Tuesday, July 13th, the stroke before midnight Pacific time. Nailed it. There will only be a thousand autographed volume two books. When they are gone, they are gone. You will get the books before Halloween, volume two or volume one, both books. When they're gone, they're gone. So uh, thanks for supporting cool projects like this. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye, guys. If spirits threaten me in this place, Fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions.